Thank you, team. Well, that song epitomizes the issue that the religious leaders had back in Jesus' day when they questioned uh, not themselves as far as their own holiness there, but they were uh, truly focusing on everyone else and their lack of holiness. And so this morning, as we come to uh, our passage this morning, we're in Mark uh, chapter 2, and we're going to begin here in verse 13. It's uh, pretty fascinating when you stop and you think about all of the uh, all of the passages that Mark has compiled. The Holy Spirit of God has given to uh, Mark exactly what you and I need to hear, and it's very very important that we understand the significance of how all of these different things are playing out because they are very very important. And when we look at them all together, they really paint a picture uh, that we really don't want to miss. And so it's very important that we understand all of these things in the context in which they're written. Would you join me, please, in just standing for a moment as we uh, look at Mark chapter 2? I'd like to read a few of these verses that we'll be looking at here this morning. So please stand in honor of God's word, and I'll pick this up in verse 13. And he, that being Jesus, went out again by the seashore... And all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened, he was reclining at the table in his house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. And when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to the disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Father, we ask that you would just bless the word of God today. Help us, Father, to understand that you have come to call sinners unto yourself. And Father, we're reminded of the love that you have in doing this and just being able to leave the glorious throne room of heaven and come down to this place, a place full of sin, a place full of wickedness, to walk among people who are sinners. And Father, we thank you for the love that you expressed in coming yourself in the person of Jesus Christ to come and stand in our place and take upon yourself the sin that each one of us possesses. So bless, Lord, I pray the word of God this morning, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When you think of Jesus and you think of uh, him coming and talking to those who are viewed as people of low esteem within the society, I want to turn your attention to a couple of cross-references, if I might. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 through 18. Romans 3. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, and together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Another passage is Psalm chapter 14. And I think that as Paul was writing Romans, he was building off the thoughts here. In the first three verses of Psalm 14, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heavens upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Well, from God's perspective, let's make it very, very clear this morning that everyone is a sinner. Every single one of us is in need of a Savior, whether we recognize that or not. One of the things that stands out as we're going to go through and pull apart this passage in Matthew is the fact that Matthew is a tax collector. He is a sinner in the eyes of society, and so he is definitely in need of some type of saving. 
But the Bible makes it very, very clear that all of us are in need of saving. When Jesus said, I came here not to call those who are well to myself, but to call sinners, he was talking about the reality of our mind. In all of our minds, there is a position that we have taken. You're here this morning, and you have taken the position that either A, you're okay with God as you presently sit there this morning, or B, you recognize yourself as a sinner, and you have already placed your faith in Christ, calling on Jesus Christ to forgive your sins so that you can have a pardon from the penalty of those sins. So in other words, you're either here this morning, understand the reality of sin in your life and the fact that you are a sinner, or you're here saying to yourself, no, I'm okay with God just like I am. There are many, many people in the world today who believe that they're not sinners. They believe that they're truly okay with God. They have strange ideas that they've never got from the Bible. They have strange ideas about someday when they die, there's this big, huge scale up in the heavens, and all of their deeds are going to be weighed upon this imaginary scale. That's not in the Bible, my friends. You can't find that anywhere. The Bible condemns our works, and that's exactly what we see here happening with Jesus as he interacts with these Pharisees in the household of Matthew. Now, notice here with me this morning that as Jesus is going along, he's going along, he's passing by, and he comes to a place where he sees the tax collector. And I don't know if this is exactly what Matthew looked like, but it kind of gives you the scenario, doesn't it? He's sitting there at the table, he's got his bags of money in front of him, uh, and he is enjoying life because as a tax collector, he really has it made. Especially the fact that he's a tax collector in Capernaum. I mean, if you're going to be a tax collector, you want to be where the money's rolling in. This is the biggest seaport on the Sea of Galilee. There are hundreds of fishing boats. There is a trade route that comes right on through there. And so there is constant commerce. And he is part of a very lucrative financial operation. Now, what he's gained in material wealth, he's lost among society. Uh, People are looking down their noses at him, and it's understandable why. Due to the Roman occupation, the Jewish people were required to pay taxes to Rome, all right? You only have to go back in your history books to the United States when we were paying taxes to whom? To England, to Great Britain, exactly. And we were really fond of that, weren't we? (laughs) <laughs> we, we just love doing that, right? Uh, and, and there were all kinds of problems that came from that. Well, in Galilee, his responsibility was to collect the taxes um, and hand those over to Herod Antipas. He's the tetrarch, and he would be the person then who would submit that money to Rome. And as long as Rome was happy, Herod was happy, and if Herod was happy, then the tax collectors were happy. Do you see how it all trickled down? Herod would sell franchises. And we're not talking about McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, all right? We're talking about tax-collecting franchises. And if you had enough money, you could purchase one of those, and it was the most profitable business that you could possibly have. I mean, it was amazing. Now, you'd squeeze out a little bit of extra money. Those tax collectors usually had some, some, uh, you know, I'll I'll break your kneecap people that work for them. And they would go out and they they would, as employees, put the pressure on the people. And the people hated to be pressured in such a way as you would be. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been charged protection money, uh, but I wouldn't think that that would be something that I would look forward to as a business owner. Uh, But this is the kind of thing that would go on during this time period. They had all kinds of taxes. They had imaginary taxes. It was kind of like whatever you could come up with. Uh, they, they had a poll tax. It was an income tax, about a 1%. They had a land tax, which was one-tenth on everything that was harvested off of your land. Uh, they had taxes on the transportation of goods. They had transportation tax, goods tax, produce tax, use the road tax, crossing of bridges tax. They probably even had a rain tax, right? 
They had every tax that was known to man. They were trying to come up with new ones all the time. And they would charge more money if you were a tax collector than was necessary to please Herod. And all of that extra money, you know what they did with it, right? They gave it to the poor and needy. I'm just seeing if you're awake this morning. That went right in the pocket of old Levi or Matthew, the tax collector. And so Matthew is his Greek name, Levi's is his uh, Jewish name, but he would put that money right in his front pocket. And so they were viewed, these people, as traitors uh, among the Jewish people because the money was going to Rome. And it really wasn't a a fair scenario at all. Um, They were despised tremendously. They were despised. Uh, really considered unclean. Uh, They couldn't attend a synagogue. Uh, They were prohibited from testifying uh, in a Jewish court. Uh, They were classed with robbers and uh, traitors and the most debased uh, people that you could find. In fact, uh, we read in the Mishnah and the Talmud uh, that a Jew uh, who collected taxes was disqualified as a judge or a witness in court. He was expelled from the synagogue. He was a cause of disgrace to his family. I mean, all of this is is going on. Uh, The very touch of a tax collector uh, rendered uh, him to be unclean. Uh, The Jews were forbidden to receive uh, money. Uh, They they couldn't even receive money and alms from tax collectors uh, because the money that was gained was from taxes that were deemed as a, a robbery. The Jewish contempt was really epitomized in the ruling that Jews could lie to tax collectors with impunity. So if the guy came and he said, hey, you got some more money, you say, hey, no, I don't, and it was hidden someplace, God wouldn't judge you for that, okay? Because there was no one in society that was worse than that tax collector. And so here we are in Matthew, and we have this curious scenario because we have Jesus passing by this one. This is someone that everyone would kind of hiss under their breath at, maybe even spit at him. And uh, there he is, you know, he's sitting there and, and he's happy because he's got all this loot coming in. And Jesus looks at this man and simply our Bible record only records the two words, follow me. Now Matthew is going to have a response to the call of Jesus. He's going to have to uh, respond to Jesus in a particular way. He's going to have to make a choice, isn't he? Uh, What are you going to do, Matthew? How are you going to react? You've heard about this Jesus. See, you remember the stories that were told, the booming voice from heaven. Uh, You remember the the, the events of that baptism. Uh, You remember some amazing things. You've heard about the healings. Uh, maybe you even, uh, even though you couldn't get into the room, they'd have beaten you half to death. Uh, you heard about the, the healings that were going on. Uh, you recognize there's something very special about this Jesus. And here this Jesus comes to you. And Jesus calls you to be a follower of his. A personal invitation. What would you do if you were Matthew? What would you do? Do you realize that if Matthew gets up from that table and he walks away from it, and he determines to follow Jesus, he can never go back to that lifestyle. Because it is built on corruption and dishonesty from the top to the bottom. Everything about it was corrupt. Matthew, if you make this decision, you are going to make the worst financial decision of your life. You are walking away from the nicest scenario that you could have. I mean, he's got a boat that's, you know, 40 feet long. He has all kinds of these great parties out there on the the Sea of Galilee. You know, he's saving up. He's going to go up to Switzerland and, and build a house up on the mountain so he can ski. I mean, he's got life right where you want it to be. And yeah, everybody hates him, but he's planning to move out of town as soon as he's got enough anyway. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow Jesus? What's the one thing that would make him think that it would be worthwhile to follow Jesus? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. He's either going to hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And Jesus said, you can't serve God and, and money or wealth. You can't do both. 
Matthew, you've got a decision to make. What are, what are you going to decide, Matthew? What's it going to be? It appears from our text that Matthew didn't think really hard about it. He just simply got up and decided to follow Jesus. You're sitting there thinking to yourself, wow, I can't believe he gave all that up. Now, if you're sitting there and you're not thinking that, then you're not on the right page this morning, all right? You need to be thinking that. You need to be going, what in the world? He, he gave up everything. Put yourself in that position. Uh, you're making more money than anyone else in society. I mean, you are raking it in. There's nobody richer than you, basically. I mean, Herod's richer than you, but he's the, he's the tetrarch. That's understandable. You've got it all. You've got all this wealth. You're going to give up all that wealth to follow Jesus. Why? Why would you do that? The reason that he's going to do that is because he recognizes that in his heart, he's a sinner. And he recognizes that he has a spiritual need in his life. Now, this is where the, the, the real tension comes because not everyone sees that. You see, for him, he looked at it, and he looked at it from the standpoint of, I have a spiritual need here. I'm willing to follow Jesus. I, I, I'm willing, and he's just so glad that Jesus has asked him. And so we follow on with this in verse 15. Because immediately after this happens and Matthew begins to follow Jesus, he's there at his home and evidently he's invited his friends. Friends in low places. Tax collectors just like him. People who were just the, the, the part of the despised club, you know what I mean? Least likely to succeed in your high school yearbook. These guys were bums in the eyes of the world. They were tax collectors, and the Bible says tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus. And when it says sinners, what it's a reference to there is that in the eyes of the Pharisees, anyone who did not attempt to maintain a lifestyle that observed all the regulations that those guys were handing down were viewed as sinners, and they were put in the category of sinners. So here you have a whole group of people, the tax collectors being most... Uh, notorious, but you've got a whole group of sinners. These are people who don't give a rip about the law. Do you know what I mean? They just really don't care. Uh, my, my family, extended family on my father's side, uh, being in Massachusetts, they were your typical Irish Catholics. And uh, if you remember anything about the Irish Catholics up there in Massachusetts, they went into law enforcement and they were cleaning up the streets. And, and that's my dad and that's his brother and on and on. And, and it was pretty interesting, but uh, very, very steeped in Catholicism. Uh, my grandmother used to, to go to mass every day at 5 a.m., every single day. She went with her sister and her brother and they would go, and then she would come back, and she would make a big breakfast, and right after breakfast, she went in, and she had a stack of cards, and they were prayer cards, and she would pray that these people would get out of purgatory, and uh, she would do all of those prayers, and I remember going back in there with her and seeing a prayer card for JFK, and she told me she was pr had to pray longer for him, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but she was very well, and, and this was what went on, and my father was raised in that type of environment. Well, when my dad, he was kind of a hellion of sorts, uh, when he got to the point where uh, he could make his own decisions, he was not interested in following Catholicism in the least. And in fact, he would have been classified, if you put it into the category of Judaism, he would have been classified as a sinner. Uh, he didn't even give a rip about all of those things. He, he wasn't going to go to Mass. He even married my mother, who was a Protestant, and they threw him out of the church. Yeah. This is the kind of uh, people group that the Pharisees are speaking of here, and this is what Mark is talking about. He's talking about people who were the tax collectors, the lowest rung on the ladder, and then he's talking about the sinners, the people who really didn't even make an attempt to keep the law. And so these are the people who are being referenced here. Matthew is, is making a great statement by following Jesus. It's huge. But I want you to see that there is a response here to uh, Jesus by the sinners. Uh, they've come together, and the Bible says they were dining with Jesus and the disciples. 
and there were many of them, and they were following him. Now, they were followers of Jesus. And just a little side note here. Not everyone who's going to be a follower of Jesus is a true disciple. There are many people who are very curious about Jesus, and they became followers. That's to say that many people who go to churches today aren't necessarily believers. They might be following along, they might be checking it out, and that's fine. And if you're here today and you're just thinking this all through, uh, I'm certainly glad that you're here. These were people who are checking Jesus out. They're listening to what he has to say. And the point is, they're able to identify with Jesus in a very unique way because they recognize their need as a sinner. And that's a huge, huge point. I put this up here just to challenge us to stop and think. The irony of self-righteousness is that it condemns true righteousness. And isn't that so true? Self-righteousness is a huge, huge problem. These sinners were willing to say, I want to hear what Jesus has to say because I recognize that I am not in a position to be even self-righteous. I want you to stop and think about what we've gone through in our study here in Mark. Last week, we talked about the paralytic. Do you remember the paralytic who was, was dropped down? He's dropped down in the ceiling, and he comes down before Jesus. He was viewed by society as a sinner because he was infirmed. They viewed it as something that he had done or that his parents had done, which was just as significant in their minds, that branded that sick man, that paralyzed man, a sinner. And so now you're looking at tax collectors. So we have paralytics who are sinners by volition, and we have tax collectors who are sinners by volition. These are all the people that society condemned. Society had come out and told these people that they're, they're sinners. You know, when we understand ourselves as a sinner, we're much more willing, aren't we, to turn to the Savior? We are. Maybe that's the reason why more people come to Christ in their youth than in their later years. When I was just a child, I was moved greatly by my conscience. Uh, my parents taught me different things were right, different things were wrong, and you, you, you can probably relate to this, but I, I surprise you, I know, but I wasn't a perfect child. And there were times that I got lickings. That's what we used to call them, lickings. You're going to get a licking. Whew. I got licking after licking after licking. And my heart was pricked by the understanding that I had about my own sin. I knew I was guilty. I used to always feel better. And those of you who were, were disciplined in this particular way can relate, no doubt, to this. When, you're, when you received that licking, you were always relieved after it was done because you said to yourself, I had it coming. I remember saying to my mother one time, I really didn't do it. I really didn't do it. And she said, that's fine then. This is for whatever else you did that I didn't see. <laughs> how, can you, how can you stand against that, right? You see, the problem is that when we grow older, we become a little bit more conditioned. We start to evaluate ourselves based upon others. In fact, the Bible tells us comparing ourselves with one another is moronic. But that's what we do. As a little child, our hearts are much more tender. We recognize that we're not Self, there's no reason to be self-righteous. We recognize that there is a spiritual need in our life because we know that when we're bad, we feel terrible about it. And we introduce the gospel to young people, and so often they're willing to place their faith in Jesus Christ. No wonder Jesus said, allow the little children to come to me. Why? Because they weren't self-righteous. Self-righteousness is the huge, huge problem that we see. Notice with me, fourthly, the response of the religious. You have to appreciate what ends up happening because after the Pharisees are looking around, they observe here and they, they are able to see that 
there are sinners and tax collectors, and why in the world is Jesus and the disciples eating with them? And they approached the disciples, the Bible says. They said to the disciples, isn't that noteworthy there? They didn't come to Jesus and ask Jesus. They wanted to pick on the disciples. And my friends, listen, I have no idea what the disciples would have answered. <laughs> Why are you guys eating with, with, with sinners and tax collectors? I don't even want to know what they would say because at this point, some of them uh, are just exploratory as well. They're thinking about Jesus and wondering uh, who he is and what this is ha what's happening here. But notice, Jesus intervenes because Jesus knows their hearts. And the Bible says Jesus heard this question that was asked. And he makes that statement, it's those that are healthy who need a physician. It's not those who are healthy. It's those who are sick. My friends, Jesus Christ came to this world to die in the place of every single sick individual. And every one of us is infirmed over our sinful condition. I believe that Jesus came, I believe he died on the cross, and I believe he died on the cross for all men. I believe in unlimited atonement. That Jesus' death on the cross was to say, all who will place faith in me will have eternal life. But Jesus is recognizing that he comes not to heal those who are well. And it, again, it's all what you're thinking. Take your Bibles with me and go over to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. One of the things we find in the scriptures is that Jesus takes a lot of heat for being the kind of person that he is. And there's absolutely... Nothing in their minds that he can do right. The dilemma of the self-righteous is going to appear to us in a moment, but the Bible says in verse 24, I'm in Luke chapter 7, verse 24, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. And he asked the crowds, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? In other words, you didn't go out into the wilderness to see a tree blowing in the wind. You went out to see something that was pretty significant. It was a trek for them to leave Jerusalem and these other areas and go and listen to John. But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. clothing. Those who are splendidly clothed live in luxury. They're found in royal palaces. You went out into the wilderness. You're not going to find somebody there in a silk suit out in the wilderness, folks. Jesus said, what did you go out to see? And he answers the question. He says, you went out to see a prophet. Question mark, but it's an answer. Yes, I say to you, the one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it's written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. At this point in time, they are going to be able to acknowledge the justice of God. Now, New American Standard says they acknowledge God's justice. New King James says they justified God. Literally, it's meaning that here they're spiritually the receptive ones, and they are recognizing God's righteous ways. This is what it means when it talks about here, they acknowledge God's justice. They are acknowledging the holiness of God. When you acknowledge the holiness of God, what does that do to you? Well, I know what it does to me. I shrink back because there's no self-righteousness in me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. My friends, listen. Someday we will behold the glory of Jesus. We'll behold that holiness of God. And my friends, listen. We are going to be so humbled, are we not? Our problem is our self-righteousness. The Bible goes on to say, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. And this is what I want you to see here. Notice in verse 31. 
To what then, Jesus says, shall I compare the men of this generation? Now, whenever he uses that word generation, it's not, never used in a good sense. What are they like? And he says, they're like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, and they say, we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a glutton, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by all our children. Let me give you a little bit of background here. Verse 31 and 32. He says, this generation, they're like kids in the marketplace. The marketplace was where you went to buy and sell. You bought food and you sold some of your own grow, uh, things that you've grown and your produce. And uh, while the parents were there and they were working in the marketplace, the children would play games. And in that culture, the two biggest events were weddings and funerals. Weddings and funerals. And so what do kids tend to act out? The things that are big events. And so the kids would act out a wedding. And they would be like, oh, you be the groom, and you know, you be the rabbi, and, and uh, at the end, uh, you practice the flute. <laughs> See, they didn't have air guitars. They had flute guitars, or flute, air flutes, or something. But they would play the flute. And when they played the flute, everyone was supposed to dance. Some of the kids would just sit there and go, I don't want to do the wedding. I want to do the funeral. So they say, okay, all right, fine, fine, okay, fine. Um, all right, uh, listen, you be, you be the dead person, and then they carried him along. And the people in the back would go, ah, 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 and that's how they acted. I mean, can you imagine? This is what they did for fun. I mean, you know, okay. Some of the kids would be there. I'm not playing the dirge game either. I want to play the wedding game. And so you always, you could not please everybody. Have you ever noticed that about life, by the way? You can never please everybody, right? So you might as well just stop trying right now. You can't please everyone. What Jesus is saying is this generation is like these children who are in the marketplace and no one's satisfied with the games they're playing. So much so that when John the Baptist comes on the scene, greatest man who's ever walked, besides our Jesus, who is, is not 100% um, or is 100% human and 100% divine, but as far as human beings, John is extremely godly. John is the kind of man who's out there in the wilderness. Uh, he's, he's, he's very Spartan-esque in how he lives life. He's not uh, an extrovert. You don't see him working with people. And so if you epitomize John's life, John was kind of like the funeral guy. You know what I mean? And they looked at the funeral guy and they said, well, I guess it's good that he doesn't, you know, drive, uh, you know, a limousine and, uh, you know, have uh, splendid clothing and big rings. I mean, I guess that's good, but we think he's crazy. We think he's demon-possessed. And that was their answer. Oh, you mean that John? He's demon-possessed? Don't, don't listen to a word he has to say. There comes Jesus. He's not dressed in camel hair. He's eating and drinking and living a normal life. And just because he happens to eat like a normal person, he's gluttonous. And he's a drunkard. And you get the picture? You can't win with these people. They're just like the kids in the marketplace. No, I don't want to play that game. And they couldn't be pleased. Now, Jesus is going to make a very, very profound statement because he's going to make a statement that you and I want to pay attention to as we notice here this last piece. Notice with me verse 35 because what Jesus is going to say here is yet wisdom. As you look at all of this as it goes back and forth, he says wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Now, what does that mean, a statement like that? Wisdom is, I believe, personified in Jesus. 
Wisdom is that which is divine wisdom, holy wisdom, as opposed to the world's wisdom. Worldly wisdom said that John, he's got a demon, and that Jesus is just a glutton. But understand this, when it's all said and done, the wisdom of God, as it was fleshed out in the message of John, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The message of Jesus, repent and believe. All of this, this wisdom that we're seeing, is going to be vindicated by all her children. Who are all the children of wisdom? It is all of those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ. It's all of those who repented even under John. Those who repented and their lives changed. The one thing that the world has no answer for is the fact that the word of God and salvation in Christ changes lives. Amen? It changes who we are. We come to God when we we set down our self-righteousness. And when we set down our self-righteousness, we see repentance because we're recognizing, whoa, 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 I am not good enough. I have a spiritual need, and only Jesus can meet that need. And I turn my faith to Jesus. That is that repentance of throwing off the, the good deeds of my mind and heart and realize they're absolute trash and they're never going to gain the entrance into heaven. And now I'm turning to Jesus, who is the only way of salvation and it doesn't stop at salvation at least it's not meant to for the process of sanctification begins and the lives that were changed were remarkable think about it for a moment Matthew is one of the most despised people on the planet and yet his life changes He becomes a follower of Jesus. He becomes a lover of Christ. And all of that dishonesty and all of those things, he threw off because his life began to change. And when you look at Matthew's life towards the the, the process as he's a follower of Christ and he's placed his faith in Christ, you see a man who's a godly man. And how do you process that? If you're the person who called him out and said he's a tax collector, there's no hope for him. All of a sudden you look at his life and you say, wow, look at how God changed his heart and life. My friends, the church of Jesus Christ is designed to be a spiritual demonstration that vindicates the wisdom of God. The church is designed to to, to be a, a spiritual entity as it will be one day presented blameless to Jesus Christ. And I know we're not there yet. I know we still sin. But understand this, our lives need to be changing. Our lives need to be demonstrating that Jesus was right when he came on the scene and he truly, truly transformed men's lives. Our God is a transformational God. You used to be dead in your trespasses and sins, but no, what does he say? And you have become alive. And you hath he, I love that old King James, and you hath he quickened who are dead in your trespasses and sins. He says, I made you alive spiritually. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All of these things are part of what God is doing. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, he showed love to everyone. The love that he extends to Matthew and to the other sinners who were, in society's minds, dregs of society, was not any different than the love that he expressed for the Pharisees too. He loved them all. Died on the cross for all of them. But his methodology methodology had to be different because his desire was for them to come and have that sin washed away. Have you come to Jesus, placed your faith in him personally? Or are you still clinging to your self-righteousness? That's a question only you can ask or answer. But it is a question that God's word asks of us. Where do you stand before God today? Jesus said, I didn't come to heal the well. They have no need of a physician. I've come to heal those who are sick. 
And as we see in God's word, that's all of us. Let's pray. <clears throat> so we bow our heads before the Lord this morning. I wonder if perhaps there might be some who are here today who recognize their need to place faith in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're here today and you're struggling with your own relationship to the Lord. You might be here this morning and, and you might be thinking to yourself, I think I'll take my chances. And so you will if you decide not to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And if the Bible's true, that won't be pretty. But you can come and you can place your faith in Jesus Christ today. Cast aside your self-righteousness. Recognize your need for a Savior. And the Bible promises that he will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. All of our unrighteousness. Is there anyone here this morning who say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my heart today. I recognize the need to push away my self-righteousness and come to Christ. Love to pray for you today. If there's anyone, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my life. How wonderful that would be. Whether or not you slip up your hand and you ask for prayer or not, doesn't matter. If God's at work in your life, I pray that you'll yield to him. And maybe you're here this morning and you realize the significance of your own Christian life. You're a follower of Christ. You're one of the child, uh, children that is talked about here in Scripture. You're a child of the King. Does your testimony truly bear up what Jesus was talking about? I wonder this morning, if you're here today, maybe you'd say, Pastor Kevin, I'm, I'm convicted. Because I don't, I'm not happy with my testimony. I recognize the need for some change in my life. Would God say that truly <clears throat> the message of salvation has been presented in your living proof that salvation truly has taken place, that the gospel's right? It's definitely something for all of us to think about. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, Lord for working in our hearts and lives today. May the message of Mark, Lord, truly ring clearly in our hearts and minds. And may we be willing, Lord, to push off our self-righteousness and lay hold of the righteousness of Christ. We pray it all now in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of announcements, and then I've got a 40-second.